Let us not forget everything that happens. It's by the will of Allah. Holy it's time to unite and stand, and we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or duty unthinkable, but to stand together as one. Turn into sooner followers, streaming. Every day, various platforms, trust me, you'll find a way, soon the followers. You just need to stay Mashallah, yes, thank you. Prohibited imitations, and this is based on the book written by Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. And I uh, please, guys, for those of you who have not yet purchased this book, you want to go to Atli online and get a copy of this book. And what Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli did was he went through the different sitta and he collected hadiths in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed um, uh, pro the prohibitions in imitating different uh, things of Allah's creation. As Muslims, we're supposed to be the opposite of these things. For example, we're not supposed to imitate the non-believers. We're not supposed to imitate the jinn. We're not supposed to imitate the opposite uh, gender. We're not supposed to imitate animals, but unfortunately, especially since we're living in the days of the Ruwaybida, that's what this is. These are the days of the Ruwaybida. We see a lot of imitation going on. Not only do we imitate the jinn, that's what those dreadlocks are. I keep telling you sisters and brothers, especially you sisters. By the way, I got another phone call today from one of the new Shahadas. She said that, uh, you know, she's only been Muslim for about a month since Ramadan. And um, a proposition was brought before her uh, by her, uh, her guardian, who's her best friend's husband. Her best friend's husband um, had a possible marriage proposal for her. But, the fact that this sister wears dreadlocks. The person said, no way. No way. I keep telling you what you sisters, dreadlocks are haram. And whenever we use the word haram, what must we do? We must bring the clear evidence. I've given you guys the clear evidence. I'm going to give it to you again. One day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the mosque and one of the Bedouins who had just converted to Islam entered. He had his hair in dreads, in locks. His hair was knotted up. It was knotted up and knots all over his head. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gestured him like this to come here. And when the man came, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do you have a comb? 
The man said, yes. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do you have oil to oil your hair with? The man said, yes. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then go home. Remove those knots from out of your hair and comb through your hair and oil your hair. He said, anyone who has hair on their hair must be able to comb through it and oil it on a regular basis. What's the source? What's the source? What's the source? Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. There's about several hadiths from Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approaching, you know, different men and telling them, take the knots out your hair. You must comb through it. Comb through it. You see that? You can't comb through a sister lock. You can't comb through a dread lock. You can't comb through a lockety lock lock. And just because you guys change the name doesn't make it lawful. That's one of the signs of the last hour. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said one of the signs of the last hour is we will give beautiful names and pleasing names to things that are bad and dirty that Allah made haram. So I don't care what you sisters call that ugly knotted up crap in your hair. It's still haram because you cannot comb through the hadith in English translates to mean comb. Take a comb, comb through it. Get rid of those dreadlocks. You want more Dalil? I'll give you more Dalil. In another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said we should do the opposite. And we're going to go over this hadith in this class later when we talk about the jinn. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do the opposite of the jinn. The jinn walk around with their hair in knots. Y'all hear that? That's dreadlocks, knots. They don't comb their hair. They let it knot up. So he told the companions, be the opposite of them. What's the source? What's the source? Bukhari, Muslim, Muatta. You want more, Dalio? I'll give you some more. The prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, the zakum tree. And what is the zakum tree? It's a tree that grows in the from the pits of hell. Its head is like the head of the jinn in knots. What's the source? What's the source? Bukhari and Muslim again. Okay, I can go on and on and on and on. You sisters. You have to realize Allah is beauty. Allah loves beauty. Allah hates ugliness. You sisters have to stop being trifling. And I'm just going to keep it real. And I know your feelings are going to get hurt. But the truth, as one of the companions said, in fact, it was Aisha, ready Allahu on her. As Aisha said, the truth is always a bitter pill to swallow. So I'm going to give you the truth. The reason why you walk around with your hair in knots is because you're too lazy to comb it. A lot of you sisters feel and believe that since we have to wear hijabs, what's the point? Why do anything to my hair? Just let it knot up. You're lazy. You're lazy. You don't want to do your hair. You don't want to pay the money to go to a, a stylist. That's what I do. You get old. I'm an old lady. 
You get arthritis, all that long hair, it's hard to comb it. So I go pay somebody. I ain't got a problem paying $150 every two weeks to get somebody to wash and, and comb and style my hair. But a lot of you sisters are too cheap to do that. So you rather walk around looking like the gin, looking like a shayateen, a devil, the devils. And you wonder why you can't keep a husband. You sisters wonder why your husbands go and get beautiful women who ain't got a problem doing their hair. Or you wonder why when you get married on your wedding night, when you remove your hijab, the, your, the new, your new husband tells you, I'll be right back. I'm going to move the car. And he never shows up. He doesn't come back because you look like Medusa. You done scared him away. And we don't want to hear about culture. Let's talk about that too. Anything that contradicts Islam, we could, it's haram. You are a Muslim now, sisters. Your culture, like I told the sister that called me today, I said, you are a new Muslim now. You're going to have to adapt the culture of Islam. And the culture of Islam is to be clean, to be beautiful, to be good, to be righteous, okay? To be of dignity, of humility and balance. Muslim women, we are women of dignity, humility and balance. That's what I tell all my new shahadas. And the older we get, we're better than wine. The more dignified you are supposed to become, the more humility you observe and the more balanced you become as you get older. We Muslim women get better with age. We get better with age. We get better with age. Okay, so you sisters who are new to the religion, you're gonna have to get rid of that Jahaliyyah, that pre-Islamic culture that you had, and now adapt the culture of a Muslim, okay? No dreadlocks, no sister locks, no locks at all. It's haram. I gave you the clear evidence. Clear means clearly saying it's haram. I gave it to you, okay? Braids are different. There's nothing wrong with wearing braids. If you sisters are too lazy or just don't feel like, I'm a woman, I know how, I've, I don't feel like doing my hair. You know, when I was young, I used to stay in the mirror. I'm conceited, I admit it. Every, the women in my family are vain. Y'all know my granddaughter, Jayla. Jayla thinks she's everything and all that. Okay, I was the same way. I stayed in the mirror. I was always doing my hair. Latifah tell you, but I'm old now but I'm gonna still look good. I keep my hair done, I go and pay somebody. I pay somebody 150 every two weeks to do it. Oh yeah, I'm high class, high maintenance. I'm a high maintenance woman. Thank God I can maintain myself, okay? You sisters can put some braids in. Braids are beautiful and braids will last. I wished I could wear braids. I can't. My hair won't stay in braids and my hair don't look right in braids. But I wished I could. I love braids. Braids are fine. Um Salama, ready Allahu anha. Um Salama had long hair that came all the way down to her derriere. She was the one that went to the prophet and said, oh, prophet of Allah, some of us, our hair is so long. Can we braid it? And when we braid it, do we have to take it a loose? Oh yeah, the Arab women wear braids. They wear French braids, they always have. Arabic women are African women, even though nowadays they don't want to admit it. Oh yeah, Layla's half Arab too. I ain't got a problem admitting that I'm half bad too. I ain't got a problem with it. But a lot of these other Arab women don't want to admit that they from Africa. We come from Yemen, okay? So put your hair in French braids, sister. And that way you at least it's neat, it's clean. 
You know, the water can run through it. You can oil it. You can take a brush and brush over it and even take a comb and go through braids. But you can't do that with dreads. Okay. So I'm telling all you new Shahadas, I know that many of you didn't know this, but dreadlocks are haram. You're a Muslim now. You have to adapt our culture of being beautiful, of being clean, of taking pride in your appearance. Our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to brush his teeth a lot. And one of the young boys here asked me, he said, Sister Layla, why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always brush his teeth? Well, guess what? His wife, Aisha, ready Allah on her, asked him that too. She said, when you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth. When you make wudu, you brush your teeth. Even before he read the Quran, he would, I mean, when, even before he would recite the Quran, he'd brush his teeth. He brushed his teeth. And so she said, why do you brush your teeth so much? He said, because I don't want to stand before my Lord with bad breath. I don't want to talk to my Lord with my breath smelling. That's how we are as Muslims. We're, we're people of dignity. You should want to keep yourself beauty for Allah, for the sake of Allah. People ask me, Sister Layla, I stay in the house. And this is how I look around the house all the time. At nighttime, I put on my, even my pajamas are nice. My hair is flawless. My makeup, flawless. Layla goes to sleep, flawless. And people say, why do you do all this when you by yourself? I tell them, I'm not alone. I keep myself flawless because Allah is watching me. I do it for Allah. Allah loves beauty. The angels of mercy, they love beauty and cleanliness. So if you sisters don't have no pride in yourself, you're going to have to work on that. You claim to love Allah, do it for Allah. Take care of your hair because Allah loves that which is beauty. Brush your teeth because Allah likes good smelling things. Look, walk around a house looking decent. This is a caftan, this is a house dress. You know, I only paid $10 for it. You can get all kind of nice little caftans off of, off of Amazon for $10. Look attractive for a law, sisters. Y'all understand that, you new shahadas? And by the way, you don't even have to use henna. You can dye your hair with Lady Clairol. Do y'all think the prophet's wives only use henna? Henna was not the only thing they used. They used whatever they could find to dye their hair with. So you can use Lady Clairol. You can use L'Oreal. I use Parisian something. My beautician, she doesn't use henna with me because my hair is already red. I don't put henna. I don't like henna. I don't like henna at all. You can use any dye you want, just long as it's not black. Everybody understand that, you sisters? You can dye your hair purple if you want, green, yellow. Just be beautiful, okay? Yes, and dye your gray hair, though. Our sister here is asking, yes, that's authentic. She said that she was also told that uh, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, recommended dyeing your gray hair. Yes, that hadith is true. Whoever told you that told you the truth. Dye your hair. It makes you look younger. Allah loves beauty. You sisters are going to have to train yourselves to love beauty too. Y'all got it? And then the man won't say, I'm going to move the car and you never see him again. Or you ain't got to worry about your husband not wanting to come around you or touch you because you look like something that came out the sewer. Take care of yourselves, women. Y'all got that? All right. So in regards, go ahead. In regards to um braiding hair, is there any pro prohibitions against men? Because you know, my culture sees that as like men who braid their hair as gangsters. 
Well, 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 the prophet Muhammad used to braid his hair. Was he a gangster? The even Umar and them braided their hair. Is that, were they gangsters? Come on, the men been braiding their hair too. Again, Islam, our culture is Islam. That should be the culture of every Muslim. Islam is not just a religion, it's a way of life. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Mecca to Medina, he had his hair in braids. That hadith is authentic. What's the source? Sahih Muslim. Okay, so no, there's nothing wrong with wearing braids. Braids are attractive. It's dreadlocks or any type of so-called, because y'all call them brother locks, sister locks. They got baby locks now. I even heard they got Goldilocks, whatever type of ox, ox. That crap is how wrong. Y'all got it? <laughs> but braids are okay. Braids are beautiful. And the way you band two sisters wear braids, y'all got it going on. I wish I could put my hair in some braids. It won't go in there, and then I don't look right with them. Yeah. Any other questions on that hair? That was for my new shahadas. Y'all got it? Okay, mashallah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're welcome. The sister here said, thank you, Sister Layla, for keeping it real. Exactly, guys. As a dyer, I have to keep it real. And long as I give the clear evidence to support what I'm saying, I'm, you know, you got no choice but to accept it. All right. Okay, so now let's get to today's class. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Give me a second too, because y'all know they the streaming program I'm using is new. They changed it. He gave me a discount too. Yeah, the guy gave me a discount yesterday since I threatened to take my business elsewhere. But let me put the PowerPoint up. And how did I work this? Let me look at how to work this too. Okay, I think, okay, hold on. I go to Zoom first. I put you guys, oh, wait a minute. Hold on, guys, I can't do nothing yet. Give me a minute. Stop screen. Okay, hold on. This is the new program. <sighs> Let me figure this out. Okay, click on Zoom, go here. You guys in Zoom can see this, right? Y'all see this PowerPoint in Zoom? Yes. Okay. Okay, now y'all let me know uh, whoever's on YouTube. Okay, I'm supposed to click this button. Click here. He said, click on here, do this. Look at all these steps I gotta go through with this streaming program now. Oh, can y'all see it on YouTube? Oh, I think y'all see it. Oh, okay. See the old main? Y'all see the old man? Okay. That's the yes, old man. Can. Okay, here Layla come. Where's the is it full screen? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, okay, I think I'm working it. Okay, is the whole thing on there now on YouTube? Can y'all see that? Or is it lagging? Oh, it's lagging. Okay. okay, yes, now we can see the full thing. Okay, yes. good. Mashallah. Thanks, AY. You helped me so much. I don't know what I'd do without my AY. May Allah make it easy for her and her family, forgive them of their sins, keep them upon Sarat the Mustaqim. I mean, I mean. Okay, this is the book, The Prohibited Imitations. Hey, I got to make my voice loud now because people, men might be listening. Yeah, remember that new sisters. Whenever you speak publicly, make your voice loud, make your voice strong, make your voice even intimidating if you can, if you are a woman speaking publicly, you know. I have a degree in broadcast journalism, so you know, I can do the Barbara Wawa. Okay, this is the book, The Prohibited Imitations. For those of you who have not yet ordered the book, go to www.adleyonline.com. And this is Shea Gatley. I used his picture because as students, you have the right to know who you are receiving your knowledge of Islam from. And I have a lot of new shahadas now since Ramadan. Got about 25, 30 of them. Oh yeah, that's a lot for us. So this is a picture of Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. He's the one that wrote this book. 
And then you got me, yours truly. You know, you should you should know who you are taking your knowledge from. That's why I use our pictures. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, today we'll be covering the first chapter, the first chapter of this book, which addresses the prohibition in Islam of imitating non-Muslims. And we're going to start off with how we don't even imitate them and how they worship Allah. You know, we're supposed to be the opposite of them. We're supposed to have better manners than them. We're supposed to be more intelligent than they are. And even when we worship our Lord, it's not the same as they do. And let's take a look at it. Okay. And yeah, chapter one begins on chap on page nine. The rest of the book is introduction. And make sure you guys read uh, Sheikh Atley's um, introduction because it's really nice. Okay. So the Sheikh starts off by reminding us that it has been long established that it is not permissible for Muslims, male or female, to imitate non-Muslims, whether it be in the way they worship Allah, whether it be in their how they celebrate, or even how they dress. But unfortunately today, many Muslims, including people who work in Dawa, in other words, including people who are like me, who call themselves callers to Islam, you will see that they're imitating the non-Muslims, you know, and how they call to Islam. So we have to be careful of this, guys, as Muslims. We're supposed to be distinct. In other words, stand out over them in the way we look, the way we speak, the way we behave, and everything else. That's why it doesn't bother me. One of the sisters, one of the sisters asked me a couple of weeks ago, she says, Sister Layla, people are always talking about the way you speak. It's a compliment because the way I speak is the way Allah commanded. Allah says in the Quran, oh, you women who believe, do not soften your voices when you speak publicly. I am a Muslim. My voice is supposed to be the opposite of the non-Muslim. I don't sit up um, Nicki Minaj and like they do, talking like a little baby, like Nicki Minaj and Cardi B do. I'm a Muslim woman. My voice is supposed to be loud. It's supposed to be strong. It's supposed to be intimidating. It's for my protection to keep the people away from me, to keep me safe from what evil lurks in the heart of man. So that's why I tell you uh, new shahadas, you know, the same for you. You better make your voices strong. Get rid of that, hey, hey, Nicki Minaj. Get rid of that Nicki Minaj way of speaking. And that Cardi B, get rid of that. You're a Muslim now, okay? So society, especially living in a non-Islamic society such as America, society wants to demean you as a Muslim woman. Society wants you to, to wants you to believe that because you're Muslim, you should be you're weak. You have no dignity. You have no humility. Well, that's not true. We're strong. We're distinct. And we're opposite they are. Everybody understand that? Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Verily, Allah will not change the good condition of a people as long as they do not change their state of goodness themselves. Remember, we went over this verse during the month of Ramadan. It's all about self-evaluation. It's all about changing our behavior, changing our dress, changing our actions and our thinking to that which is pleasing to Allah. That's what separates us from the non-Muslims. 
And there's many, many other proofs from the Quran and from the authentic Hadith that attest to this fact, that if you want Allah to change your condition into something better, then we have to work on changing ourselves. Uh, a lot of the Muslims today are so uh, bent out over about what's going on in Gaza, okay? All of us hate what's going on in Gaza, but it's not just Gaza that's suffering. The Muslims in Africa have been suffering for years and nobody seems to ever care to mention them. Maybe that's why it seems like Allah is not answering people's supplications. One of the sisters said, why is it, you know, that Allah is allowing this to happen? First of all, we never ask why Allah does what he does. Never question the Carter or the decree of Allah. He does what he does for a reason, whether you like it or not. It's your job to accept it and submit, not to question it. But maybe that's why Allah is not changing the good condition. Because what are we doing to change ourselves? Are we still living tribalism? Are we still living racism? Are we just concerned with one part of the Muslim world? Or are we concerned with every Muslim on this planet, regardless of race, color, language, or whatever else? So, you know, if we want Allah to change our condition, we have to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, are our actions in sync with Allah's commands or not? Have we become like the non-Muslims in our dress, our thinking, our behavior, or are we distinct? That's the question. I want you guys to pay attention to this verse of the Quran too. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, then we have put you, O Muhammad, on a clear way of our commandment. So follow that and follow not the desires of those who know not. Here in this verse, Allah is telling uh, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he sent him with a law that he commanded. And he commanded the prophet to follow that law. And he forbade him from following the desires of the people and their communities and their societies. Y'all understand that? How many of us are living our lives abiding by the laws of Allah? And how many of us have violated those laws? Celebrating holidays we shouldn't celebrate, dressing the way Allah commands us not to dress, wearing dreadlocks and other hairstyles like that that he clearly tells us to not wear. So again, guys, we talk about, oh, why is Allah doing what he's doing to us? Why is it that it seems like Allah doesn't hear the, the cries of the Muslims? What have you Muslims done to change the condition of yourself? Again, that's the question. Also, pay attention to this verse. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, and if you, O Muhammad وسلم, were to follow the Jews and Christians desires after you, what you have received of knowledge, then you would have against Allah neither a protector, a guardian or a helper. Here Allah is telling us that we're not supposed to take on the ways of the Christians and Jews. If we were to follow their desires, you know, we would be violating the commands of Allah. We would be just like them. Remember, guys, the Jews used to be the chosen people. Allah replaced them with the Christians, and then he replaced them with us, okay? We're not supposed to follow them in what they do. 
But unfortunately, we see Muslims today following them, adapting their lifestyle, adapting their behavior, even when it comes to Dawa, knocking on doors. I never forget that. When I first moved to where I live at here in Cleveland, somebody knocking at my door and I open it up and here it is a Muslim family, a man, a wife and two little Muslim children passing out Qurans, asking, can they come into my house? I said, I'm already Muslim, as you can see. And where did the Prophet Muhammad say we do this? You're just a Jehovah witness. What are you, a law's witness now? We've imitated them even in Dawah. It's sad. Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, has not the time come for the hearts of those who believe in Allah to be removed by the remembrance of Allah and that which has been revealed of the truth or they become as those who received the book before them and the term was prolonged for them and so their hearts were hardened and many of them were rebellious and disobedient to Allah. Here in this verse, Allah is speaking about, you know, what happened with the Christians and Jews. They used to be the chosen people of Allah. But look what happened. They disobeyed Allah. They broke his laws. They broke his, his commandments. They rejected his guidance. Their hearts became hardened. And now look at them. Okay, so again, as Muslims, guys, there's numerous verses, numerous proofs such as these that show how as Muslims, we're supposed to be different than the non-Muslims. Again, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, oh, you who believe, say not a word of two meanings, but listen, and for the disbelievers is a painful punishment. So Allah has made it forbidden for Muslims to resemble the non-Muslims in, in what how we speak and our actions. Now, some things are culture. Of course, you can't help it. You grow up in your environment and you end up adapting the dialect of the people in your uh, society or in your uh, uh, village or your town, that stuff you can't help, okay? But the cursing and profanity and things like that, we're not supposed to resemble them in that. The way they walk around with their pants hanging down, we're not supposed to imitate them in that. The way the women walk around with their derriere showing, with tight clothes, we're not supposed to imitate the unbelievers in that. But unfortunately, we do. And what I want to speak about today are examples as to how we have emulated them, even when it comes to prayer. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This hadith is narrated by Abu Umar ibn Anas. He talks about how when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first migrated to Medina, he was anxious as to how to gather the people together for prayer. So a group of the people said, use a flag, just raise a flag at the time of prayer. And when the people see it, they'll, they'll pass the word along. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, nah, I don't like that. And then another person said, well, why don't we use a horn? Because that's what the Jews do. When it's time to pray, the Jews will, you know, use a horn. The Prophet said, nah, he didn't like that either. He said, this is the Jews. He said, we want to be different from them. So then somebody said, well, why don't we use a bell? Just ring a bell like the Christians do. The prophet said, nope, I don't like that either. Because again, we want to be different than the Christians. 
And then finally, there were several companions who had a dream about the human voice being used. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked that. He said, that makes us different. That makes us distinct. So here you can see that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not want to resemble the non-believers even when it came to letting the people know the time for prayer. We call the Adhan today. We use the human voice, which sets us apart from how the Christians and Jews gather their people. Also, we have another hadith where one of the companions said, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had went to Mecca, Medina, I went there and I visited him. And I said, tell me about the prayer. He said, pray the morning prayer and then stop praying when the sun is rising until it's fully up. Because when it rises, it rises between the two horns of, of shaitan and the non-Muslims prostrate themselves to it at that time. So here we can see, even when it comes to the times that we perform our prayers, the prophet is speaking about the Fajr prayer here, okay? We don't pray when the sun is rising because that's when the non-Muslims prostrate at that time. They worship the sun. And again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted us to not resemble, to not resemble the pagans, the Buddhists and the Hindus. The Buddhists and the Hindus, they're the ones that prostrate and worship the sun at that time. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, pray because the prayer is witnessed and attended by the angels. So you pray until the shadow becomes about the length of a lance and then stop because at that time, hellfire is heated up. So what prayer is he talking about now? He's talking about the time of praying Thur. We pray Thur until we can see the shadow. When we can see our shadows, that's the time for Asr. And that's also the time that Allah allows the hellfire to take a breath. And then the prophet said, when the shadow moves forward, then, then pray because the prayer is witnessed and attended by angels until you pray the afternoon prayer and then stop when the sun sets because again, it sets between the horns of the devil. And that's the time again that the pagans prostrate themselves. So again, guys, we can see the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took care to make sure that even when we perform our prayers, that our prayers don't resemble, the call to it doesn't resemble the non-Muslims, nor do the times we pray resemble when they pray. And again, these are all authentic hadiths. This source is Sahih Muslim. Okay. Also, you know how the non-Muslims go to the grave. They go to the grave and talk to the dead. They go to the grave and pray to the dead. Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, those who came before you, they used to take the graves of their prophets and their righteous men and make them mosque. But you must not take a grave as a mosque. I forbid this. This was a question that somebody asked me yesterday at my Q&A show about talking to the dead people and praying at the graves. It's haram. This is what the non-believers do. This is what the Jews do. This is what the Christians do. We're opposite them. Again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, act differently from the Jews because they do not pray in their sandals or their shoes. Now, what is this hadith talking about? 
This hadith is the dalil that you can pray with your shoes on. There's a lot of Muslims out there who think that we have to take our shoes off to pray. I remember when I made Hajj, and you guys know, when I made Hajj, that was the worst time of my life. The worst experience of my life was Hajj. When we went to make Salat, I remember some man was fussing at me and, and trying to kick me because I had my shoes on. And I remember I had to, you know, tell him, you know, it's not haram to pray in your shoes. The prophet said, be different from them. The Jews, they take their shoes off when they pray. But we're different. We Muslims can pray in our shoes. I pray in my shoes all the time. SubhanAllah. Okay? Also, we have another hadith. Whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if one of you has two pieces of clothing, you should pray in them. If you have a single piece of clothing, you should use it as a wrapper and do not hang it upon your shoulder like the Jews. Here, the prophet is even speaking about the way we dress when we pray for the Muslim man. Don't resemble how the Jews dress when they pray. So again, as you can see, guys, Islam is all about us being distinct being different from the non-believers, not being like them. And finally, we have another hadith, whereas uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rode a horse in Medina. The horse threw him off at the root of a date palm tree and the Prophet's foot was injured, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we visited him to ask about him and we found him praying while he was sitting in the home of Aisha. So we stood to pray behind him and he was silent. And then we went to visit him again to check on him. And he offered the prayer sitting. We stood praying behind him and then he made a sign to us and we sat down. And when he finished the prayer, he said, when the imam prays sitting, then you pray sitting. When the imam prays standing, then you pray standing. Do not act as the people of Persia used to act with their leaders by standing when their leaders sat down. So here we can see in this hadith, another hadith in regards to worship or prayer where we're supposed to be different than the non-Muslims. And again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade that a man should sit in prayer, leaning on his left hand. Why? Because again, that's the way the Jews pray. So here we can see, guys, in just these few hadiths here, and by the way, I'm going to show you, yeah. And these few hadiths here, that as Muslims, we're not supposed to imitate or emulate the non-Muslims, not even in the way we pray. 